In this episode, you'll learn how you can make service design stick inside your organization. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, I'm Marcus Hole, and this is the Service Design Show, episode number 147. Hi, my name is Mark Fontijn and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are some of those hidden things that make all the difference between success and failure, all to help you make great services happen that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Starting out as a product designer, Marcus Hall has been on a journey that took him to become the global head of service design at JP Morgan. Before moving into this in-house role, Marcus gained a lot of experience working on the agency side. So having both the experience from working on the inside and the outside, Marcus in this episode shares some key insight on what it takes to make service design work inside an organization. We talk about signs of success and how you know that you're making progress. We discuss the three key elements of design that you really need to double down on. And finally, how to make sure that you don't get stuck working on the small and incremental things. As you'll hear, all the experience that Marcus brings to the table helps to quickly cut through the noise. So if I had to pick one word to describe this episode and what you'll walk away with after listening to it till the end would be clarity. If you'd like to keep on growing as a service design professional and enjoy conversations like this, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon because we bring a new episode like this every week or so here on this channel. So that about wraps it up for the intro. And now it's time to jump into the conversation with Marcus Holm. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Hi, Mark. Glad to be on the show. It's a real uh, pleasure awesome. to talk to you. Yeah, awesome to have you on. Uh, you've got some super interesting experience, background that I think a lot of service design professionals will be able to benefit from. So looking forward to our chat in a second. Uh, but Marcus, for the people uh, who haven't looked you up on Google, LinkedIn, or any of the other social media profiles, could you give a brief introduction what you do these days? Uh, yes, so right now I'm the head of service design for JP Morgan, and it's a B2B bank. So I've got a team of about 12 people that help a team of 160 designers map and design services across the B2B bank. Awesome. Um, we'll get into that uh, for sure in a second, like I said. Uh, Marcus, I'm not sure if you know, but we have a rapid fire question round. I have five questions for you. Your goal is to answer them as quickly as possible. The first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Uh, you ready? I'm ready. Yes. All right. Uh, if you could be an animal, which animal would you like to be? Uh, wolf sounds good. Social. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could recommend one book, which one would you pick? Uh, I think Sapiens. Um, very fundamental for what how humans tick. Mm. If you could work in anywhere around the world, which place would you pick? Difficult choosing between London, Berlin, one of those. Okay, London, Berlin. What was your first job? First job was as a, you mean as a kid or as a designer? As a kid. As a kid uh, delivering newspapers, age 14. Okay. And uh, final question is, do you remember the first time you got in touch with service design? Yes, I was at a conference in Milan and they made you, they introduced this journey mapping thing. It was totally mind blowing. And I thought, hang on a minute, there's a different way of looking at things that's more of a, what you do with a thing okay uh it's a dmi yeah. conference actually mm. hmm. remember which year it was when was that i think about 10 years ago okay okay and uh the rest is history <laughs> actually not no listen i read an article by a guy called oliver king from engine first in you know, 1999 and he talked about going upstream with design, we were frustrated. You design beautiful things and then never go anywhere. So he said, well, you have to go upstream and design the company and this is how it goes. So I thought, wow, this is, this is very interesting. That was 1999. It wasn't even called service mm. design then. I remember yep. that. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely pioneers. Um, Marcus, uh, <clears throat> let's dive into the topic of today. Um, if I uh, look at what we prepared, then uh, one of the summaries I had written down is like the difference between doing service design inside an organization and outside the organization. You've done both. So you have an interesting perspective on what it means, what the challenges are, and maybe how their approach uh, should differ. I think that's super valuable for a lot of people. Um, so that's the topic we'll be diving into. But to start off, um, maybe you could share a little bit about your journey and how you got to the place where you are today. I had some pivotal moment in my career as a designer. I started as a product designer and then I got into telecoms, designing mobile phones. And I was at Telefonica in the UK, a company called O2. And we designed this amazing proposition. It was like for the family. And that was 90, it was 2007. Uh, it had, you know, the moment families have their calendars on the kitchen, everybody writes their stuff in, or nowadays maybe Google. At the time it was paper. So we thought, let's have a digital solution where each family member can book for each other who picks up the kits from ballet and goes out on a drink. So we had a Google calendar before Google calendar. We had an iPad that we'd made that thick before iPad existed. And we had a tariff that goes for the whole family. And it was beautiful, but way too advanced for us. So it totally crashed because everybody designed their own little thing, right? The, the device people, their thing, the calendar people, their thing. So massive failure for the business, unfortunately. Spent millions on a TV campaign. It was beautiful, very visionary. I thought, it's no good designing pretty things. You have to design the company first, right? And that's how I actually got into saying, hold on a minute, let's stop designing stuff, be that digital or physical. How should we work? Let's work like designers do. Let's, you know, work together from day one. Uh, let's work in little sprints and agile. Let's make prototypes and check if that's what the user wanted. You know, we had things like there was no browser button on there because we thought we did, we wanted people to buy our apps. So it was literally done without design thinking. And that's how I got into design thinking and thought, look, I need to pause designing things and start designing, you know, how we, how we do stuff and introduce this sort of double diamond kind of thing as a system to O2 in the day. So that was a change for me, how I got into more of a service kind of world. And and from there, so uh, you started out with a pro uh, product heritage, product design heritage. Uh, you saw that it's not enough to design products. You actually need to design maybe the environment. Uh, what did you do after that? Like, how did, how did you, how did it manifest in your life? Well, inside. I think what happened was this DMI conference I went to, and there were some people from Swisscom who were quite visionary and what they did. And I thought, hang on, minute, this is exactly what we need. You need to have a lab and a way of training everybody how to work like designers a little bit, work together, build prototypes, interview users, understand what they need. And they'd roll that out across their Swisscom, Swiss Telecoms area. So I literally went to Swisscom like three times, met them, wrote everything down. Okay, gave to go to my people in O2 and got them to agree to a company-wide program to set up this way of working um, for all our consumer products. So that was kind of how you start moving from, you know, designing the thing to designing the company. It was new to me as well, but because of this failure we had, we had suddenly people listening. I think you sometimes, I only get asked service design contributions when the old way doesn't work. Oh yeah, no, we know what we're doing. We have an idea, we just build that, it'll be fine, trust me. And they've done that three times, same in JP Morgan. If that doesn't work, then think, you know, people start thinking, hang on, we're missing a trick. How else could we work? So that's usually how you get in as mm. a service designer when the, the pure jumping to solutions doesn't, doesn't work. That's already uh, uh, an insight that people can take away from this. Like sometimes it's very, it's very hard to sell the future. Uh, people find it hard to make it tangible. Like what's the potential benefit? If you can tie it to failures, or uh, the, where the existing system breaks down, it's it's much easier. Like people get it much faster. Yeah, and, because it's counterintuitive, yeah. right? It's easy. I think we're all wired to do to admire things and buy things. You, as a service design, you're selling a service. Uh, you're selling a way of working, really. And they don't know what that is. They said nodding when you present. I've that, seen that so many times. I've got hundreds of pictures running a service design agency. And you can't blame them if you haven't done it before, it's really hard. So rather than a thing, here's your website, here's your app, which is very tangible. How many lines of code, how many screens do I get? You have to buy into a, an approach, very hard to sell. Super hard to sell. Um, yeah. 
you mentioned something about your time at the agency. So when was that in uh, this journey? I spent a little half of my career roughly in agency and half in-house. So I had my own product design agency for like seven years. And then I ran a London-based service design agency for two years. And uh, fast forwarding to today, uh, your role at Barclays, uh, no, JP Morgan, the other one. Um, how would you describe that? What is your day-to-day -day activity? What is your responsibility? Well, one of the jumps I made, it's hard as an agency to do service design, right? Because you're not doing a thing. You're not delivering something. Here is your app or here's your banner or here's your whatever it is. You have to, you know, service design goes across all these silos, right? In order to impact that, you either have to be on some sort of retainer and be in the company working with people. But you can't do that as a sort of flashy three month and, uh, you know, sprint. Here's your beautiful blueprints and your personas. It, it doesn't go anywhere. Somebody called it the most expensive books shelf stopper book stopper at the ceo's shelf right um and that's true so you know if you want to do service design you have to have that role where you embed it with the product team to guide them through all the obstacles that you're trying to do and doing that in-house actually i saw what when i started after the agency to help out some friends and jp morgan i thought well look you're inside you can talk to these people it takes some time but that's what we do now and yeah Go for it. Yeah, and yeah. What, what's your responsibility? Like, do you have uh, what? What are your KPIs? Oh, KPIs. Um, we your often personal. get our, yeah, huh? yeah. For version your personal, order. yeah. The KPIs. So it has changed a little bit. We came in thinking, okay, we just design your service, but you know that doesn't work as we know because people say they understand. And one episode is quite interesting. We ran a lab to start with great endeavor we set it all up in sort of four month sprints and after the third project every time we do it i do we do a little design thinking training module this is what design we call it design thinking because service design might be a little bit too abstract and everybody has heard of design thinking so it's a little bit of a door opener every time we do this training and then nod after the third time one year later the guy who's running the program said marcus you know your presentation this time design thinking that was spot on you should have done that the first time around i said Tom, it was the same presentation because it was the same presentation. It just shows how people have to learn. You know, it's a bit like us in the bank stuff. It's so complex. You have to hear it multiple times before it really sinks in. So that, that's one of these sort of eye openers um, of what we do, which is literally a lot of facilitation. So the three things we do is we do um, customer first because a lot of things are driven. We're in technology. So a lot of things are driven from tech. There's lots of shiny tools out there, data and AI, or from the business side. So we bring in the customer kind of angle, right? Start with the customer first. And again, that sometimes only happens after they tried the product approach and didn't go anywhere. And they say, okay, what, what, what are we missing here? Oh, should we try with the customer? Okay, let's give that a go. The second thing you need is co-create. Right. In an old fashioned kind of organization, you have a lot of silos. So somebody writes down their requirements on a piece of paper and then hands it over. It's literally a word document and everybody interprets that in a different way. It's a bit like if you're an architect and you say, look, can you design the house and you write it as a word document, right? Window in the top corner. When you make a model, you suddenly see what's going on, which is the third element um, is that we make prototypes early on. Right. Traditionally, even, you know, some of it is agile, some of it's not agile. Stuff gets built. Engineers need to want to finish it, need to, need to show people what, how great it is. Let's finish it first. And then it doesn't work. So we introduce these three things. Customer first perspective, co-creating together with the people from day one and building quick and dirty prototypes. And that's more of a facilitation game, right? We can't just go in and say we're designing your you know, asset servicing or agency lending services. They're so complicated. We don't understand half the stuff, literally. You know, they, These people have been doing these very specialized B2B services for like 15 years. Very hard to understand. So the service designer in my company now is very much a facilitator on bringing the people together and provide that framework and that freedom to, to, to think and create. Mm. What's encouraging about uh, what you're describing is that it's not complex. Like these three things are, I think, dear to many service design. I, I hope they are dear to every service design professional out there. And we sometimes feel that it, it's not enough that it needs to be more fancy or more advanced, but like the human perspective, co-creation and prototyping, like if you bring that in, that already is, a, that adds tremendous value. Um, so that's already encouraging. The question I had, yeah. 
Yeah, also, she, I was going to say, you know, the labels, uh, what is service design? So you go to the US and their service design is not as unknown as here, right? I uh, tried to recruit service designers in the US and you can't find any. If they go by the labels of user researcher or experience designer or design strategist, actually, it's quite big over there. Um, so we, we had the choice, do, are we the design thinking team here or the service design team? Because everybody's heard of design thinking, right? You have an easier game because, oh, you're the guys who think like designers and so on, like customers. But then it's very much about thinking. So we wanted to, we wanted to design as a doing, not thinking. And also we wanted to emphasize service perspective because a lot of companies, they're running on product, right? My thing, my product, 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 product. So we said, no, no, the service around the product needs to be designed. You're selling financial services. You know, it's literally, if we're living in the service economy, 80, 85, 89%, whatever, are, you know, services that we ship. So that's an interesting debate we're having in, in service designs, certainly in the US, where it's more called experience strategy, for instance, in our sister company, Chase. Um if I look at uh, the recent services that I've been doing with the salary report and the career track report, I think uh, six, no, 40% of the people who participate in those survey don't have the title service designer, or yeah. but still associate themselves with the uh, field, which is totally fine. Um, so yeah, the labels, um, uh, it's more important, like you said, that you sort of grasp that it's about services. And I think we still have a lot of development to do there as a field as well. Like what are services truly? If we look at service design books and literature and courses, like they aren't really about educating you what a service is. They are about educating you about the process, but not so much about the service. I, um, but that's, that's a different rabbit hole. I, <laughs> I don't want to go into right now. What I'm curious about is, um, based on what you described, like, uh, your team is mostly uh, sort of facilitating or has the orchestrating role. Um, how, what does success look like for you? Because it's, you, it's hard to take ownership of like the tangible product that maybe a product design again. So what does success look like for you? Yes, yeah, tricky one because we had a few sort of failures, right? We turned up and we had, oh, we need to, we have, we can help people with wicked, big, big complex problems. And they say, oh, we got a big one. We're trying to wrestle it for 10 years. Onboarding in financial services is very complicated, right? You have to do all this due diligence. There's no money laundering. It's quite complex if you're onboarding, say, an asset manager fund or something like that. Oops, hang on, phone going. <clears throat> Turn it on to silent. So, um, so we went to like agency style, go in with a researcher, service designer and a BA, you mapped it all out and it didn't go anywhere. And we're like, hang on, what have we missed, right? And it was going back to the roots. We weren't plugged in. So success factors are if you are, you need to be plugged into the team, right? You need to sit at the table. It's not an agency kind of gig where you are the person over here doing service design. It doesn't go anywhere. And you know when you're winning, when they they put you on the table you also know when you're winning when they are sharing your work so when they get really excited and you work with them a lot of people do get service design or design thinking it's it's just it's been educated out of us as ken robertson said from school so by the time you hit 25 certainly in banking you're sort of left with the left part of your brain really um so you bring out this right hand side of the brain of people and they're flourished they love it right everybody likes drawing you just bring that back so people tend to embrace that and then they tell your story and they do a better job a because it's them telling but also they have the slight vocabulary we still sometimes struggle as designers you know in terms of talking the way we talk that that gets translated in the right kind of lingo that the senior people in the bank want to see so presenting they present your work that's a great success another success for us is um if we get funding for more, you know, we have now a way of going in. It's another way to succeed, I think, is don't do big projects. Right? We had to learn it the hard way. We spent six months, built everything. We now go and say, look, we don't quite know what this is. We sort of do. Same for them. They think service design sounds great, but they don't really know what it is. So let's do a sprint, you know, six to eight weeks, maybe 10. And we make sure we come out with a little prototype. We do the whole little double diamond research. What is the problem? You need to agree on the problem first, because if people don't agree on the problem, then everybody's got a different view of what the solution should be, right? So you need to say, look, this is the current journey map. We mapped it out. These are pain points. Everybody agree with them. And once they have that, you can then work on a say, future um, prototype or blueprint. Um, so that little sprint is good. You don't blow all your money in one go. 
that means there is a bit of money left for the next. Also, you know, companies do have six weeks to give you the benefit of the doubt to see what you can do. And also for you, good, because you're not like going off and boiling the ocean over here when it isn't really what they needed. Because sometimes they don't actually know what they need either. Um, so these little sprints are good in order to say, look, we're doing this little sprint and that is safe for everybody as a trial. And what op often happens, you then frame the problem. You've just basically gone back and said, well, what's the real problem? Example, right? We get asked, we need another dashboard. I need to know what's going on. We got hundreds of dashboards. Um, so yeah, okay, let's look at it. You know, and then you start with saying, why? You know, why? Why do you need a dashboard? Why do you need to find out where? So it's the five times why, and gradually you get to what, it, what is the real problem they're trying to solve. And that, that you can do that in six weeks, all the way down to a little prototype of, here's some screens, or here's a role play storyboard of what that new service could look like. And everybody goes, yeah, we created that together. We have thought of the user as our little prototype, show the boss and say, hey, we've done this in six weeks, right? Can we have some more money now to actually implement some of these things? So that's the third one when you get to know you're winning. If you do get budget to continue either on that engagement or in our company, they have to put money in for next year. You know, tech, tech development goes on an annual cycle. Super interesting uh, stuff and good to know that those are like the uh, success indicators. I'm, I want to cycle back to something that you said at the start is you mentioned it doesn't go anywhere and you sort of skimmed over that what do you mean with that i have been doing design engagement as an agency mm -hmm. as a freelancer we had agencies come in do the same thing um because the company doesn't know sometimes what they're buying you go in, you do all this great work, um, but you haven't either got all the senior stakeholders on board 100%. Um, you deliver the beautiful blueprint. Everybody's in awe about this thing, but you know it's like a masterpiece. Don't, don't touch it, right? Even we're doing blueprints in Excel. We started doing them in Excel in the bank. Still, don't touch it because they will use Excel. It's their bread and butter tool. But the whole concept of this, this blueprint and these prototypes, it's a very sort of designerly way of, of you know, thinking. So you can't come in with these sort of necessarily the great artifact artifacts if they're not plugged in what i mean is when you when you now come in we we do not always do a blueprint we do a framework it might be a just little diagram of how we change the the way they're answering customer service calls for instance but you need to do these little things together with them and that's what i'm saying if you just come in and deliver a thing like you would for a website or an app perfect right here's your website here's your app totally legitimate or designing a physical item in service design, it is a service which is lived by the people in the company, multiple silos, and has to be built with these silos. Because often you get hired by one person who's got one silo, and they can't impact the bits on the other silos. So what do you do? Either you help this guy just improve, the, or you know, person improve this one silo, but you still really have to sort out the thing further up front. In order to do that, you need to bring people together. You need to invite them into the workshops, hear their opinions so they're on board. And that takes time, right? But that's how you then win. And that's not a big ta-da reveal. Here's your blueprint and 15 personas, journey maps, and a click-through prototype. <laughs> Whilst that's nice uh, and beautiful artifacts to make, it's often the success is in, in meetings when they agree, yeah, we want to work with these people now, go forward. First time we're talking to technology, actually, in years. And that's, that's the win, right? Mm. So is it about when you mentioned uh, it doesn't go anywhere, like the success, ultimate success factor is that people are ready to take the next step in the process, whatever that is? Yes, because I mean, it's probably a bit exaggerated, it doesn't go anywhere. But what does happen, people start thinking, oh, well, that's an interesting approach, right? But don't literally take your blueprint and build that because it's a big piece. It's five years worth of work. So um, yeah, you need to take these sort of in, in small pieces and then pivot or also you know when you present your small pieces what what what's make them tick right you, you have to look out and when you see them say look you know thank you for the blueprint but that model that thing over here that is what we need and you know you, you wouldn't have known that at the beginning mm -hmm. so yeah the the sort of the purpose of the game of the goal of the game is to keep playing <laughs> like yes it, rather than delivering the there is <laughs> You could almost say, like in service design, maybe there isn't a final end product. Yeah, which there isn't. Uh, ends, there <laughs> if, isn't. If like, you're it, successful, you keep going. That's actually a uh, success indicator on this onboarding project. You keep We're still yeah. at it three years later because exactly. we're making progress. Exactly. And I think that's that's totally true because, um, like in service design, I've defined it often as uh, you cannot deliver uh, 
the best service. What you can do is you work, you can work towards better services because they are always evolving. The world is evolving. Customers are evolving. So that's different mindset compared to like delivering a tangible outcome. Uh, you, it's like it, almost a hygiene factor. Like you can't keep on, you should, you need to keep on working at it. Yeah, and as you say, it's totally ephemeral, right? It's it's not a thing which is so difficult to sell. If, if you're designing a product, a car or a chair, at some point you're cutting steel and making plastic pieces by the millions. You know, you have to have a cutoff time. If you do digital, you do, you know, you lay down code and at some point that thing goes live. With the service, it's, yes, you do change. Basically, two things we change is usually the org model, how people do something and who does what, and then the tech underneath, right? What are the platforms and services they use for that? And as you say, they go in, they go in ping pong, they go in, in small bits here and then a bit there. So it's kind of messy service design. When it works though, it's amazing, right? Because you, that's what I'm saying, the people element is there. You know, we have people who are doing crazy tasks because the work volume is going up in operations and you're eliminating these tasks and you made them talk, everybody talk together mm -hmm. for the first time in onboarding. We met, we have four people talk together and work together, which haven't been talking together properly or not working in the same way before. And that is, that is satisfying. It's, it's a sort of like, a, it's not a thing. It's an enlightenment thing when these people start saying, thanks for services, Anna, we know what we're doing. Thanks for introducing us. <laughs> and that's, that's what you've done with your journey map. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a means to an end to actually get to other stuff and, uh, and get the organization working in a different way. And I, that's one of the reasons I think we need to use metaphors to explain what we do. And there are tons of metaphors, like the one that's coming up to me right now again, is like the garden, the organization is a garden. The garden isn't finished. Like there's always work to do in yeah. the garden. And uh, um, one I mean, other uh, metaphors, yeah. garden probably wouldn't in the bank, the bit hard nose. We try gardens mm. and things like, oh, yeah. yeah Iceberg worked well, right? You have, we've got this iceberg thing where we're saying services are icebergs. So a lot of stuff happens under the surface. You know, this beautiful picture of an iceberg. People spinning, very busy. A lot of them don't have a view of what the customer sees, right? So you need to, we bring in that view above the water level, what the customer sees and what really matters to them. And a lot of people spinning with all sorts of features developed down under their water surface, not relevant, right? So that's a good metaphor I found works in business. Uh, the other one is a double diamond process. You know, I know it's not perfect because it's it's linear and all that stuff. I, I do like infinity loop and things like that. But the guys we work with in banking, the logic of first diamond, agree on the problem, you know, diverge, converge, is all quite logical. And that, I found that a good way of selling your design approach, um, at least in financial services. Mm. Um, related to this, you mentioned something about uh, the six weeks or eight weeks um, they give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I'm really curious to that because um, when you're in-house, I can imagine that you sort of have some credibility and some sort of, uh, uh, what is it, goodwill that people are willing to give you of, uh, the benefit of the doubt. When you're coming uh, in externally as an agency or consultancy, usually you get hired to deliver very hard results, hard outcomes. How do, how do you... How do you see this thing so combined? So we call in the agency, um, we called it the whisperer, right? We, you need a whisperer we, because we came across one person, Siobhan, in Ireland. She was amazing because she was the key for us to get traction. She, had the, she was the connection inside to A, translate what we're talking about to the business in the banking language. And we worked with her both at the Bank of Ireland and the sort of Waitrose equivalent island called SuperValue. So she a, sort of translated the language, but also she sort of guided us just to a little thing. I need something tangible. Can you do me some wireframes? But we don't know yet what it's going to be. You know, I mean, it's that sort of stuff that where you stumble as a service designer. So we did that and that translated, that whisper between back and forth. She guided us through the process. You need to have that. Or it's super helpful if you have an internal person who understands what service design is because it's difficult to buy and manage for, for many people in companies. And what is the uh, biggest maybe mistake that you see clients making when buying service design well we've bought, we've bought that sort of design from agencies even in jp morgan and i think people buy digital assets from digital agencies they know they're going to get so many wireframes and pages or an app so they think service design is a similar thing right you deliver me my blueprint and my storyboards and whatnot uh, maybe even a role play 
and but you know that's not it, that doesn't cut it because you can't do anything with it the work only starts once you've done that then the real work starts actually building that it comes back to the thing we're not we're not having a thing that we can hand over and say here it is and they say oh i switch on my service and then it runs their service is run by their people so you need to get all these people on board and i think that's the misconception they buy stuff from agencies three months then a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars whatever and then you expect it to be done um so it's painful for the agency in a way we had better agency con connections um what well, success if you get yourself hired again and again in little jobs that's what i'm saying do a little sprint and then they get come back come back come back so that's what l2 we had the agency in there for two years we have worked with live work for two years because it's in little pieces but you need to as an agency, it's hard to sell yourself in. Um, okay, I can do this service for you, but it's going to take two years. Is that all right? And they go, like, what? Right. <laughs> Comes back to the whisperer. Who's the person who can explain that to the boss? Yeah, exactly. And this is like the catch-22 because you do want to come in because you, you know you can help them. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the classic. You need to give them what they want and then give them what they need sort of so you sell them the blueprint or you sell them the customer journey map in order to actually get access to do the things that they need have you seen similar things we, we have but as i say you often then blow the whole budget the agency spends that budget on that on that three-month engagement and it's a sort of mega big fat fancy blueprint with loads of fancy looking cool stuff which is you know great work but they can't stomach that it's a three uh, amounts of work that they have so you're better off as an agency just spend like some of the money first and say let's do this, let's do a little sprint to see in eight weeks six weeks depending on the size of company if it's a startup you can do that in four weeks if it's a company like JP Morgan everything takes ages it's have to so it would count more like twelve weeks but what you do is you show them a the methodology and b a tangible output like a little prototype for a service to get an idea and then they say ah oh, that's great okay now we've got a better idea of what we actually now need thank you right but the money has been spent if you're not careful so I know it's tempting as an agency got big fat job three hundred thousand dollars let's just do it right but i think after that you're out right yeah so you're out and and sort of the all the effort is gone <clears throat> the maybe the challenge uh that i also see is it's tempting to deliver that tangible and shiny output because it's something that people can take inside the organization and sort of say look this is where we spent the money on if you if you do a six-week project and you come up with a paper prototype, I think that's the right approach. But how do you then? Somebody needs to sell it internally. Somebody is going to need to take accountability that this is the way we need to go. Yes, that's the whisper, and that's that's not yeah. not easy to get. I mean, one way is you do this blueprint, but as again, a not spend maybe all the money, but also have have the blueprint and then build one little thing, tangible little prototype that they they can show everybody. This is how it goes. Click through, right? on the back of the blueprint one item of it because the blueprint usually has multiple items on it just to show you know what would come next so they can see it um and the blueprints you can make a nice blueprint you don't have to spend you know these really good ones spend a lot of effort on that the whole concept of a journey map is still new to many clients right they don't think of their service or whatever their product do in a in a journey kind of format or life cycle that alone and if you did it in a week is already sometimes a news to them so um, yeah. So, and this is one of the, I've been out of the agency world for uh, a few years right now, but one of the last things that I was doing there was when we did a project, always at the end of the delivery, I would show them some kind of a roadmap. Um, and made, usually always uh, also halfway through, like, okay, we've done this project, but look at all the other steps that need to come. Like you're paying for this right now, just know that this isn't the end. And I think, uh, let, let's stick with the journey metaphor because we like that in service design. You also should present that journey to your clients rather than a one-off thing. And I found that that really helps to help get clients to take the next step to see, okay, I, I understand how this piece fits into the, the road that we're heading into. And it's our role, I think, to show that, that roadmap. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, we often do this horizon one, two, three planning. You know, you do a lot of prioritization matrix impact versus effort, for instance, that helps. Um, and then as you say horizon one, two, three, because sometimes, you know, you come in and say, look, I know you've got all these problems, but if you just keep fixing yesterday's problems, how are you ever going to compete and leapfrog? 
let's look at the future. And then, you know, that's tricky if they end up with something that you know, is five years away, nothing in between. So what you do is you do the future, very exciting. You know, this is the, you could make a video how the future onboarding would look like, great. But then step back, okay, that's Horizon 3 or 2. What could you do next year? What could you do now? And the beauty about yeah. service design is it doesn't have to be tech spend. A lot of these things are the relying, you know, digital design on, on building it in code. A lot of the elements you could do right now, it's a different workflow, the different way of people working together, costs nothing. You could do it straight away. You don't have to wait for tech money. So, you know, these are the little things you can sometimes do. Again, sketch them out, the roadmap alongside maybe these I think we call it key service moments. When we do blueprint, we do the blueprint, that's fine. But then we pull out the key service moments, right? Um, and then illustrate them. So this is what happens here when a new person, a customer service agent gets called. This is the systems they use. These are the people and how they work. And that brings it to life. You can say, oh, that one here, we, we, we could do that now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's, that is a really strong point that maybe is uh, overlooked often. If you do the small stuff, which you should because it's easier to digest for organizations. Don't forget to show the bigger stuff as well. Yeah. Like then, uh, then you're probably going in the right direction uh, and giving people confidence that it's not just a small thing that you're working on, not just a small tweak here, but by by turning this wheel, you're contributing to actually turning the entire ship. That's uh, you're right. You're uh, right. Yeah. And also the the big stuff is is also the kind of it's exciting, but it also gives people this license to think bigger and you know have a have a view forward because they're doing a lot of practical problem solving every day anyway. So that combination, as you say, of fifty thousand feet and five hundred feet is is where service design is really strong. Yeah, and uh, I haven't been using that in my practice because it wasn't so popular then back then yet. But I think frameworks like the OKR framework, like objectives and key results, strategy maps, anything that helps you as a service designer to connect your activities to the biggest strategy, that that's a tremendous help. And uh, the stories I've been hearing is that often, like your clients don't even have a view on the actual strategy. So that's a very valuable conversation to have at the start as well. But um, learn about strategy, like learn about uh, objectives of uh, of the organization and tie your efforts into into that. I think that's I super mean, beneficial. Yeah, it totally is because we try, we, we try, we push for doing the metrics every time we do a blueprint. We call it instrumented journey because number one, you want to know you're winning. What, what are you actually trying to achieve here, right? Um, as an, and we use Google's framework from outcomes to signals to metrics because otherwise metrics you tend to sometimes find that people measure what's easy to measure, not what should be measured, right? Because the stuff you should be measuring is actually really hard to measure. So it needs to be a bit of both, right? Um, and then we have the blueprint and we say, okay, what's the outcome for the clients? And then the metrics and the signals and what's the outcome for the business on the backstage? And you can put that into every blueprint. Um, so that, that helps, uh, you, you're right, you know, but also we, you, get, you get pushed, you get the scope moves in service design, right? You're uncovering all these problems and then you get sidetracked on one part of the service over here. You need to be really careful, certainly also as an agency, that you're not just delivering the wrong thing. Oh, you said you'd do this. Yeah, but you asked me to do that. So I think metrics and outcomes and OKRs can really help say, okay, right at the beginning, what are we trying to achieve here? How do we know we're winning? What are the top three that we could track? They might change, but it's good discipline. You're totally right. Now, you're in-house right now, um, and you've apparently learned a lot uh, what works and what doesn't, and what are some uh, indicators of success. I'm still curious about what, you, what you're currently still experiencing as some of the biggest hurdles that still need to be taken in order to be successful. Yeah, I think... I think we're battling still a little bit with understanding at senior management, because the if you really do a service, you go at quite a sort of high level, meaning you have to have multiple silos. That means you have quite high in organization terms of the decision makers, <laughs> decision makers who can decide and open up that gate. So the silo man hires you, a woman, but they can't impact the other ones. So you do need to go go up, and that that's tough, right? I mean, we we've been working with some of those senior managers. It's great, but it's a lot of convincing. They've got many things on their on their agenda, but if you need to have actually the the ear of the board, either at C suite or the CEO, on that. When we've done that as an agency with Bank of Ireland, it worked because they are the guys who can open the doors, and so they don't tell anybody. They don't say, "Oh, you must be doing the service." No, they just give permission. 
right? It's all about empowering because you get often hired as a service protagonist who knows what design thinking is and stunning elsewhere but they hit the ceiling when their boss is CEO doesn't know what you what it is and why you need money and so on and where's the thing that you're delivering um, so it's more the permission thing that you need if the CEO knows what it is um, so we done this design thinking training at O2 with, with the board and the CEO and it was very successful because that's not they're not doing it but they see what's coming up and say yeah okay so that's what mm. you need in order to do that. And I've I've had this conversation often, and it's it can be a bit discouraging, right? Because when you say that like every service design project needs to have the uh, the CEO CEO vouch for it, like yes. that almost stops every project. It so, does, it does, and you can't. We we have got the, uh, the CEO's ears for this stuff. It's a massive place we're in. But I think we get enough traction with the middle level people, the protagonists, right? That we can show stuff. So I think it does work. It's it's a challenge. I agree on especially on the really big projects, um, but you do have to work bottom up, and it, it it does work because in the end they're running the service. And but you get even within that level, you have to convince the operations people, and you have to convince the tech people um, before you can get to the client. It's another challenge in banking. Talking to clients is super hard, right? Because they're very protective, especially in businesses, right? They're either super wealthy customers or they're big corporations. And in banking, it's always we need to develop this stuff before we can show it. It's, 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 it takes some leap of faith. You know, like in retail, they know you talk to the customer. You have to say, I don't know, you know exactly what we're doing. We want to do the next generation of X. In B2B banking, that's still a new concept. So, yeah, some way to go in that. So... Uh, and, and I think banking is, if it works in banking, then it works anywhere. Uh, that's the good thing. Um, I think healthcare you... is similarly tricky. People okay. Know, yeah. yeah. yeah Heavily die. regulated. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now, <clears throat> just a quick question related to this is, are you seeing any patterns of things that actually do give clients, stakeholders the confidence to uh, adopt this? way of working so if you're working your way up like what are some of the things that you see them going aha okay now we can move forward for it again it comes down to the thing 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 um if you do have tangible prototypes for instance that that opens doors because again there's a secret sort of um superpower of designers is visualization right don't underestimate that um they just write brds and, and and lists of text we come and we can visualize this stuff fairly easy right uh so that is actually quite a powerful tool i have to say if you visualize what this thing might look like that service or thing that you're talking about and that then gets shown obviously you know the proof is in the pudding how would you build that that where the roadmap comes in you can work with technology to build a part and get some real data pick a slice of this with some real data and show it in action i think that that's how you win people over. Build a real piece with some real functionality behind it. We've done an interesting um, service design prototype in for a bank, a retail bank, uh, where we designed a whole new way of opening a bank account for consumers in Ireland. And then we did something called Concept Lab. So we took over the headquarter branch in Belfast, moved all the furniture around in the evening and made paper prototypes and all sorts of props. Got some customers hired in um, and showed them, you know, the simulated the service if you like and then iterated overnight and tried it again next day and that was also interesting because the, the ceo was in the building came down to have a quick look he stayed for two hours he talked to the customers waiting in the the users we recruited in the waiting area these guys don't talk to users they're busy people right? unless you work for john lewis but have to do two days a week or so, a year on the shop floor it's oh, so interesting talking to the, the users. Great project. <laughs> you never know how you win hearts and minds, right? But it's demonstrating, showing stuff is exciting. Designers can do it and it's very tangible. With everything that you're saying, like we just should and need to double down on the things that make design design, right? And uh, it's, it's great and it's important to sort of understand the way people on the quote unquote other side think how they talk so that we can uh, uh, close the gap. Um, but then we should translate that and stay true to our design nature, not become Excel ninjas or, or right, do the visualization, yeah. do the prototyping, uh, get them to interact. Um, so <clears throat> uh, you have a lot of experience. Um, one final question I have about uh, agencies 
you're now in house, you have both perspectives. Um, what is the future of agencies? Do you think? Whoa, big question, huh? There's always a need, I think, even in house. We sort of somewhat sometimes we are an agency. The expert come in, right? Um, so we had a project where we said, look, after telling these people, she did, was one of these whisperer people who knew how design works. But I've been telling them for three years, they're not listening to me anymore. Can you come in as the experts with some researchers, with PhD title? And, you know, you come, I'm, I'm just holding up the mirror to you, right? And saying, this is what we find. Um, you know, we can help you do the next stage, but we're just very neutral. That's a role I think an outside person or an agency is, could, could do very well, right? Um, sometimes you adopt that role on an inside. Mm -hmm. And then I think yeah. agencies do work. I mean, some of the big consultancies, they're in there for years, you know, Accenture or McKinsey, because they work with, with people. I think as an agency, if you find that yourself, you get a, get a seat at the table to advise strategically on design. How could we do next? What next after this? And how should we design? How should we over here? You know, no job too small. You know, that's that kind of approach. Mm. Um, I've worked very successfully with agencies on that. But it, you have to be in, inside rather than the ta-da, three months everything done thing, which in service design is, is tough. Yeah. And we sort of have to battle the heritage of the word design and the notion that people have around that as it's delivering uh, It's tough, outcome. isn't it? If you drop the yeah. design, then you're in with the other consultants and tech and so on. There's always a question. You drop design because people think you're just doing chairs. You shouldn't. Well, on the other hand, it is, you know, if you can show a little bit what design can do, that is something magic about design as in creating something so yeah i know what you're saying it's a tricky discussion about is it design is it, should we stop calling us self designers because they think we're designing just wireframes or chairs but yeah mm. i don't th <laughs> i don't think so but i uh, also think no, I that we don't need to sort of uh uh keep shouting it from the roofs like we need to wait for the right moment to introduce design uh, i yeah. think that it's about timing um <clears throat> so market we talked a lot about a uh, uh, talk about a lot of things that's the thing i wanted to say like uh if you look back on the last 45 50 minutes if you had to summarize our conversation like what's the thing that you hope will sort of stick with somebody who's listening right now i think one of my biggest lines is service design is is works only if you're working in partnership with the people i find it um hard otherwise so you know, go in house, either you work in house or you develop that relationship in small pieces where you help them gradually along the journey. You know, any job I would look at literally if it goes well as a two year engagement, right? I know you can't always say that. <laughs> That's going to be two years. But, you know, some people do know it's going to take two years or a year. I think make the time, you know, that that's one of those things. Um, I think time is in our favor. Things get more and more complex. People need more and more help with complex stuff. Service design, design thinking can really help here. So I think we're sailing on a on a on a on a you know wind behind us, um, tailwind on that. So I think you know don't lose hope. I think design is going up further and further the strategic route. I find which new challenges for the designers having to cope with business models and canvases and as you say roadmaps. You know can't just design your nice little thing. Be careful what you ask for, but. Do your craft, do it really well. I think that's what we try to do, and and, and you'll you'll succeed. So that's one of the the lessons learned. Um. Thank you. And one final question, uh, because it inspired me so much. You've been doing this in house with JP uh, Morgan for three years. Where do you hope you'll be in the next three years? And I I know it's a glass the the, the magic glass ball question, but if everything works out, what do you have? in what do you hope you'll have i don't know there's years. always new areas you think when you, the grass is greener right i think um b2b banking is fascinating it's super complicated i've had no idea about the financial world what goes on there it is uh, truly fascinating but i also sometimes think solving more like you know either bigger problems like sustainability and global warming that'd be fascinating too because it's a super complex problem right service designers should be able to tackle that just having to you know find the right engagement for that or working with loads and loads of consumers, working for a, you know somewhere in the government or working for India or well, I don't know, somewhere where you're literally touching 100 million people with your little improvement. That's maybe something that's also fascinating. Sounds like a, a great uh, 
uh, what is it, uh, flag in the distance. No, that's not the right English saying. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, I know what you mean. So. <laughs> the, uh, uh, we know what we mean. Anyway, uh, Marcus, it was a joy uh, talking to you. Time flew by in this episode. Uh, Thanks for having me. It was really yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, thank you for coming on. No, it was great. And look, always happy to talk to anybody who's interested in you know, pushing our common cause here of like service design. It's a small group, but I think it's fascinating and it's got a lot of big future. But we, we're not there yet, unlike UX, for instance, which started almost 20 years before us. So, so yeah. onwards and upwards don't, Like together. you said, don't lose hope. <laughs> no, that'd be good. It's great that you're one of the people who makes it all the way to the end of this episode. I really hope that you enjoyed it and got something useful out of it. If you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button to get notified when new episodes come out. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you very soon in the next video.